Right. Hi, Mike. This is Mike Spencer. How's it going, mate? Yeah, not too bad, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, for for those that aren't familiar with Mike, and you really should be, um, you were the 1999, if I said that right, British karting champion. Um, you raced Formula Super A in 2001. I wasn't yeah. sure what you did in 2000. So, but I wanted to start really by asking about like as i understand it your uncle raced as well so it's so karting was sort of in the family by the time you started is is that right um yeah my my dad's brother dougie he was a junior british champion in the 70s and uh, also my mum's brother was um international champion in the, the late 60s or early 70s as well so as he comes from both sides of the family um, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah, karting background, it was always going to happen, to be honest. Um, you know, as soon as I could walk, I was at a kart track. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing, um, when uh, when I watched you race, I think it was in 2015, and it was at Ella Park when you were with um, John Wellstead and Glenn was racing as well. Yeah. And um, it sort of revealed, like, how entrenched, like, you're, you're like a proper karting person because you were talking about setup engine stuff and there was like a depth of knowledge between you and john like mm. and you've worked together for for so long right? like how did you sort of develop that knowledge was it with john or was it like as soon as you were sat in a cart you'd turn you you know your carbon and all that well um it started with my dad really because he'd um he'd been involved in karting for 20 years before i even started um working with obviously my uncle was the first um and then doing a bit with uh, the likes of terry fullerton and mark with all other british championship drivers that he looked after um and um you know he he sort of when when i was in cadets for example um all the equipment would be in the garage and basically um he said if you want to go racing um you've got to come and sort of help and sort of get hands on and help you prepare all this stuff and sort of learn what does what so from the age of pretty much eight years old, um, that's what I did. Um, I grew up with spanners in my hand and sort of it became second nature really. And then and then sort of working with, like sort of as, as you come through, I've worked with various sort of really experienced, successful people in karting um, and you pick up stuff from, from them all the way through. I mean, obviously I've been um, sort of working with and good friends with John Wilstead for 25 years now. Uh, since I was 13 when I mess, first met him, um, you know, and it influences the way you go about things when you're at the track work, and working with certain people. Um, now, we did th this this video like 10 years ago. I think it was called Chump versus Champ, you know, yeah. so you're like a British champion and I'm a B-final winner. And it was quite informative because, like, I don't, I don't want to say I'm revealing your secrets or anything like that, but... It seem now. It seems to me that you, when you drive, you have a very. You're not just going and driving flat out, sort of brainlessly. You're you're considering a lot of things like the tires, the tire life. Like, how did you develop? Because like there was, I think it was the first corner at Rye, and I was sort of going in, tanking it in, and you could see me leaning on the left rear. Where you were, you you could set. We were about the same pace, and I'm not saying I'm at your level, but you were you were driving. At that corner, right? This sounds really bad. But don't don't take this the wrong way. Like I'm not saying I'm at Mike's level, right? I was. I think we finished the lap. I was four tenths off, and I was joyous with that. But like, you seemed. It seems like you're a driver from a different era, where like you're considering every single element. Like, when did that start to come in to your driving? Like, because obviously you did Super A, and you raced on the super sticky rubber that they used to race back then. Did it? Was it from that era, or was it before that? Um, there was a lot of things really. I mean, when when people drive a car now, they're not having to choke it four times a lap, adjust the carburetor every single lap, you know, protect the front tires and all the rest of it. It's when you grew up in the the hundred cc era that I did, with the sort of the softness and the like the grip level we had from those sort of tires, you had to think about not just your racing, yet the, the main thing was preserving the tires and, and controlling the tires. So A getting them hot quick enough. So you're not sliding about wearing them out um, and then regulating the tire temperature through your driving. And that's something that I've sort of learned from my 100cc stuff, you know, in the late 90s. 
Um, and it's not something that people really have an issue with anymore because the tyres are a lot harder than they used to be. Yeah, they'll go off two or three temps a lap sort of after 60, 70 laps or whatever. But, you know, you could destroy a set of front tyres in 10 laps if you really wanted to back then, um, you know, and if you didn't know what you was doing. And I just sort of, that became, that had a massive influence on the way I drive. Um, and I've just sort of, I carried that all the way through my karting career. It's sort of second nature. It's sort of the first thing I think about the most is what are the tyres doing all the time? You know, so if he's sliding slightly through a corner, you know, you adjust your driving the suit. So it doesn't do that on the rear or the front. Whereas these days, it's usually a case of uh, uh, the cart setup's not quite right. It's doing this or it's doing that. There's sort of the the way you had to cope with things back then. There was a lot more going on when you was driving the carts. You know, so not only was you thinking about the tyres and you're racing, you're thinking, well, is the motor going to stop the next lap? Oh, I'm on the carburetor every single lap, making sure you don't end up at the end of the straight sitting there watching the racing. Um, you know, you drive in one handed for a lot of the right, a lot of the racing as well, because you're obviously choking the engine four or five times a lap, depending on the circuit to make sure it stayed together. So it's it's a different style of driving to nowadays. Um, you know, and that's what I try and sort of teach my younger drivers I work with now is sort of a bit of a, an old school method of racing, you know, to be smart. And unfortunately, it's it's there's not many people around anymore who, who know how to teach that. So which is why I enjoy what I'm doing now. Um, and like you say, it's, it's sort of where the difference in driving is just a case of having a massive amount of feel and adjusting your driving to suit the way the cart's handling. And that's something you had to do. And that's something I was told what I had to do by my dad. There was no, there was no option, you know, uh, it's not, it's not quite right here. We'll sort it out then, <laughs> when, you know, that's what I got. <laughs> yeah. Cause I think um, you raced cadets at like, as you, you, you were part of the, I don't know, I don't know how to call it, but there was like a generation from like, I guess it started roughly 93, 94 to 97, 98. And that's not doing any discredit to any of the cadet champions before that or after it. But it was like a very, it was just when sort of cadet karting in the UK really started to gain traction in popularity. Obviously then, you know, champions of the future sort of happened. And that was just before your era. Like, but the level of racing at that, that time was for cadets. That was when... I don't know, maybe I'm wrong. It, it was sort of when the Brits kind of cemented our... It was like the early stages of cementing our dominance. Because in the last five or six years, we've had quite a few British world champions. Like, And it seemed to me back then, that was really when cadet karting got good. I don't know. I don't know what you, what you think about that. Because you had Nicky Richardson and Conway mm. and everybody like that. Yeah, I mean, it sort of started a couple of years before... I was cadet. I was cadet British champion in '93, and the two years before that, you had the likes of Jensen Button won the cadet championship, and that was probably when it started to really become a serious class because they allowed you to feast the engine to get more involved in the engine side of things and the chassis side of things, um, and it went on from there really. So you had myself, the likes of Lewis, obviously, and good friend Chris Rogers. Um, you know, there's quite a, you know, Gary Paffett up the sharp end in the cadet class as well. Obviously went on to, to test drive in Formula One and win the DTM championships. There was, there was a sort of a multitude of a lot of good drivers came from that sort of early to mid 90s era from cadet karting. You know, who all went on to sort of do bigger things, you know. So it was, yeah, it was hard. I mean, cadet racing then, like racing against Nicky all the time. Nicky a very good driver. Um, you know, we was arch enemies back then. We're like we're sort of friends now. We don't talk that often, but you know, we, our outlook back then was is we was there to race each other. Um, you know, you was there to race against all the other people on the grid, and you know, we wasn't really interested in being friends. <laughs> it was <laughs> well, no, it, it was a competition thing. That that's what it is. It's competition. You know, so that that was how I approached it. That was how we approached it, which is why we were such um, so hard. It was so hard to beat each other. Mm. It seemed like a really good era. Like we obviously, it's so easy to say, you know, Jensen Button or Lewis Hamilton, but you forget, you know, the Chris Rogers, yourself, Nicky Richardson. That is to me. It's, there's no. I don't really make any, you know, distinction between them, which is kind of the nature of our sport because we obviously will look at Lewis and 
you know, especially because the champions of the future, which really was like the big, you know, the, the thing that sort of helped him. But yeah, it was just it was just a great era. But I can't like obviously you were the British champion. You were like one of the last of the air cooled British karting champions. Like, and then you've obviously come back in and you've done a lot of retro stuff. Is it what? what what is it about the sort of hundreds that that you still find kind of still attractive from a from a driving perspective? Like, is it, what 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 is it about them that you think? I mean, and obviously you did road tax as well, and we'll talk about that. But I just thought I'd touch on the hundreds because obviously that's where a lot of our our soul is, I guess. Um, first thing, pure and simple, when when you drive a hundred cc, um, well, there's two things really. Is a the engines aren't restricted in any way, shape, or form. It's pretty much open tuning, other than bore and stroke. So, you know, you haven't got a lot of the electrics you've got nowadays holding the engines back as such to make them more reliable. And the second thing that's more that's enjoy about driving a hundred cc is is the amount is the the amount that they are lighter than carts now. When you drive um, 100cc, you can drive the thing, even on the same tyres they use now, say the Comet, for example, you can actually push the car a lot harder, drive it through slides and stuff like that. And, you know, you drive a 100cc car much more on the rear than you would, say, a Rotax or an X30 now. And I, my the biggest thing I put that down to is the weight, because you haven't got another, say, 20 or I think um, the weights back then were sort of in the 140s for 100cc Formula A car with driver so and that's now the current junior weight um you've got that much less weight on the tire you can actually push the thing a lot harder without it folding over and just breaking into a slide all the time you know um probably the most the best handling and most enjoyable cart that i've driven is the oldest cart that i've driven which um it's actually john welsh did his own own make of chassis which was a ricard cart that he homologated back in the early 80s that i, I did wrote. not know that and that, that thing was unbelievable. It was a two bearing car, 30 mil axle, and it's the best handling thing I've ever driven. But the whole car complete with fuel wheels, fuel wheels, tires, engine, the whole lot weighed like just under 50 kilos. It's like 30 kilos lighter than what they are now, 30 to 40 kilos lighter. You know, it's, and when you drive something like that, you can do what you want with it. You know, it's it's more about the driver than it is than it is the chassis. You know, about sort of because there's so much less weight there, putting a stress on everything. Mm. Yeah, I think it's something that is it's we easily, I guess, with with kart racing and I guess with all motorsport, the kind of the overarching experience sometimes gets uh, put aside for like the pure racing elements, and that's why single mate racing is so popular now. Mm. Whereas trying to communicate, like I, I, I look at you and John, and I, and I look, I watch you, and I watched you very carefully, and I saw like a proper mm. racing unit, and I was like, you've got your tuner, then you've got your driver, and you're having these discussions, and it, you, you're both trying stuff, and I don't. The problem is that I get, I, I can be like saying, oh, modern karting is this or that, but it does feel, from my perspective, like culturally, it's it, we don't seem to, we still have it, I guess, so with with young drivers and they're getting taught and all that kind of stuff, but. I think it's hard to articulate just how cool that was to watch, you know, watch you go racing and your attitude and John there. I don't know. It just adds a bit of colour, you know, and experience and knowledge. But I don't know what you feel. I, I guess that leads into me saying, like, what is your perception of modern karting? Because obviously you did Rotax Super 1. You did that at a high level as well. It's not like you just did hundreds and then stopped. You, you raced in Rotax as well. So you, you you're very familiar with that world as well so what, what are your thoughts on the change you know into that kind of style of racing um i mean when, when you talk about sort of watching the way me and john were obviously we worked together for a very long time and whenever we go testing racing wherever it just carries on like it didn't finish to be quite honest you know we both sort of know the the way each other works and we work very well in terms of um the sort of the modern karting and the single make series um, you know, it's it's good from the point of view that if it was an open class now with multitude uh, with multi makes of engine and all the rest of it, it just escalates the cost like astronomically. I mean, you look at how much it costs to go and race in Europe these days, and not everyone can afford it. Um, 
you know, not everyone can afford racing in the UK who wants to do it, but it's certainly a lot more realistic than it would be if, say, you've got 10 different makes of engine. So, you know, and um, obviously you've got all the different chassis and stuff like that, but the options were endless in 100cc, um, you know, and that's why it was sort of so important for someone like myself to have someone like John behind me because... I had the best stuff all the time. You know, I knew I'd go to the track and I wouldn't be ever be at a disadvantage with him doing the engines. Um, you know, he, he, we was never far away from the mark in terms of the ones, the one make stuff. Now it's, it's what it is these days. It's the way racing's headed. Um, not only from a, a cheaper point of view for the, the racers themselves and to simplify things, but, also from a money-making point of view from some of the manufacturers, you know, that karting's been manufactured in that way these days. And that's what it is now. Sort of the, the, the days of sort of, you know, the, the smaller teams and all the different makes of engines and the way things were run then. And the, the safety aspect is a massive thing, obviously now with the body work and crash testing this and, you know, help from safety and stuff like that. We didn't have any of that then, you know, no one got involved. You know, karting sort of went under the radar in that respect, you know. And, yeah, there was injuries now and then. There's injuries now and then the, these days. But, you know, it was it was a, more a case of sort of the drivers regulated the driving back then rather than sort of, you know, bosh, crash, bang, well, drop down nose cones and all that sort of stuff that has had to happen. We didn't need any of that then. All the drivers knew each other well enough not to sort of really mess around too much. You know, what's so your, yeah. What's your view on the drop down bumpers? Like, I I felt like I like to play devil's advocate on those because I I hate them, but I also agreed with them <laughs> because I was like the loading at the starts was getting a bit of a joke. Like, um, you know, Kart Masters was was coined Crash Masters, and and I hated the idea because I'm like take them off, but in the realm of what you have to do because of the regulations, they kind of make sense, but. What what are your thoughts on on the, the drop down stuff and the route that Carton has gone in in that sense? Um, same as you, really. I don't like them, um, but they've served the purpose. Um, the the driving standards at one point, certainly in in juniors in this country, got completely out of hand. There was multiple red flags, big injuries happening, usually on the first lap, and something had to be done. But it, it became the norm to push and shove like that in certain classes because everyone thought, well, if he's going to do it, well, I'm going to do it twice as hard. And it just escalated and escalated and got worse and worse for over a couple of years. And then to be fair, when they brought the drop downs in, it's helped in some areas. Um, I don't think it's perfected by any means, um, you know, because obviously you can get a drop down with it without it being your fault. For instance, if you're at the front of a train of carts that are sort of all pushing from behind, you know, so there, there are plus sides and negative sides to it. It's not ideal, but it certainly helped the situation with the driving standards from what it was. Yeah, because I don't, I think in the UK, I don't know if it was, the, if it's the mix of sort of narrow, small circuits and hyper aggressiveness, but it was, it got really bad here. And I know obviously the directive came from the CIK, but it was... At some, it was almost laughable. You could go kart masters and just say, "Right, let's all go and watch at the first corner, and just count like a bingo card how many how many mm. were going to come off." Um, but like, we can't we can't not chat because you about this subject because you raced Formula Super A, right? And <laughs> for most people, that kind of represents the pinnacle of our sport. I think it ended in last year was O two when Vandergaard won it, if I'm mistaken. Mm. Um, and your year it was Liuzzi. Um, could you talk us through that experience, like racing internationally at that level? Because um, it to me that's like the, the the stuff of mythology in our sport. Yeah, I mean, um, I leading up to my sort of European racing, um, I only did. One race in juniors in Europe, which was actually, which was a good one, to be honest. It was the Monaco Kart Cup. That was my first ever European race. Um, and we finished on the podium, finished third. Um, and obviously, it's my first one out there. That was pretty good. Then I had um, a bit of a bad year the year after, because uh, the week before the British started, 
um, I actually had an accident and uh, broke broke one of my legs the week before the British started. So sort of 98 was a bad year for me. Um, then obviously 99, that was my sort of my first full year um, doing British and European racing, which was Formula A and um, Formula A in the UK and in Europe. Um, we finished sixth at the World Championships um, and I won the British as well, which was quite good. Then the year after was a hard year. We had a change of equipment, change of team, and it was a bit of a disaster, to be was honest. Was that Top Car in no, 2000? No, this was, um, this was on another UK manufacturer's car. I won't mention it. That's fine. And, um, and then it was nothing really to do with the carts, but it was the team support that we needed. And there was no UK-based team that sort of went to all the European races. Um, the cart wasn't bad. Um, it was just the whole situation wasn't right. And then my, my manager actually stepped in, which was Peter Collins at the time from Lotus. Um, and um, he said, um, I, I, sort of, I know the guys at Top Car. He stepped in and um, I went and did a test for those guys. And I loved it there. Um, There's brilliant people to work with. Um, and that was actually my first year, not, not with John, because obviously he did all the UK stuff wasn't really sort of that involved in the European stuff other than sort of the year 99 really and the stuff he'd done before, but he was concentrating more on the UK. Um, so I went to drive for the factory coma team with Top Car. And um, yeah, I did, I did Formula A um, most of the year. And then um, one of the Super A drivers dropped out for the last round. And that's when I did my first Super A race, which was at um, Michael Schumacher's track. Curtain. I didn't realise that was the one. Oh, okay. So is the... Yeah. Well, you could obviously like that when when shit like I'm trying to avoid talking about F1 drivers on this mm. right because as a sport I think we've we've we should focus on the carters right but there's one F1 driver that I kind of like because Schumacher did go and do karting and he did ra he entered races like yeah. he was just a normal bloke so I always yeah. I always have a, like a thing where I go fair play to Schumacher because there's no chance now that a Ferrari driver is going to go and do a world karting championship event. It's no, he, he just did it because he loved it. You know, I mean, yes, it was his circuit, but you went in Park Ferme eh, before the races and there he is bolting his wheels on like any other driver. You know, it's if he wasn't wearing a red suit and you didn't know it was him, you wouldn't have known. Simple as that, you know, and it was it was good. You know, I mean, we, we had a pretty good meeting. It was not a great end. I got taken out in the final. Um, I got put over the top of uh, Sauro Sassetti. By another Italian driver who didn't like being beaten by a Formula A driver in his eyes, um, you know. But that, that was that. It was it was great experience. It was really fast, um, you know, and I, I loved it. And then to be honest, um, I went car racing the year after, and we had a good year of doing that. But the, the year after would have been a great year for me in Super A because I'd sort of been and learnt all the tracks and done a load of the European racing. And sort of previous to me going Formula A in Britain, I hadn't done much out there in juniors. And a lot of the drivers, you were sort of, it was different driving on the rubber. I mean, you'd go to Genk, the old circuit at Genk, and the rubber on the pit corners would go down over an inch thick on the tarmac. And it was just a completely different style of driving and experience, you know. And it took me, it took me the best part of the first year to get into it. And the last race of the year was the World Championships. And... We led it and raced for the lead and ended up sixth eventually because uh, because I destroyed the front tyres. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's it's different. I think if you're going to race at a high level in Europe, you've got to make a decision as a young driver now and go, right, am I going to go and race Europe at a high level when I go seniors or am I going to jump straight in a racing car? In my opinion, if you're going to get straight in a racing car by the time you're, what, 15, 16, you can race in a racing car now then I wouldn't bother going and doing the European racing personally. I'd race in the UK because the hardest racing is here. The racing itself in Europe is actually easier. The UK drivers are the hardest to beat when it comes to actual race craft, in my opinion. Um, the European racing, it's just, it's, it's just different mm. because of the, the nature of the circuits and the tyres you have to use and all the rest of it. So that, that's, that's what I think anyway. I mean, and we obviously talk about costs and no, no, before before I talk about that, I want to rewind. Uh, like the Monaco, the like the Monaco car event 
is like one of the, another part of this history of the sport where you go, God damn it, I wish we still had that. Yeah. <laughs> like that must have been a pretty mega event. Like I, I've got this thing where like the good thing about carts is you can race them anywhere. Like you can race them long circuit, car parks, Monaco, wherever you like. Um, and in places that f are kind of odd. So what was the experience like going to Monaco and all of that kind of stuff? Um, yeah, it was a sort of, that was my first time obviously racing out the country. Um, and uh, we used to go as a family racing everywhere. So it's me, mum, dad, uh, and my sister as well. And um, sort of loaded all the trailer up, went as a privateer. Um, so it's my dad running me. I mean, a bit of an unfair advantage as a privateer personally, because, you know, my dad, <laughs> he knew what he was doing, the, the old man. And um, jumped in the, in the motorhome, towed the trailer down to Monaco from the UK and um, got there. And it was when the racing started that it, it all changed because obviously the kart track was on part of the F1 circuit. So you drove the swimming pool complex, Rascas, um, and then you went on to the Formula One pit lane was the main straight. And then they put some chicanes in and a ramp and down to the hairpin and then you come back towards the swimming pool. And it was mental. When the racing started, you'd sort of look up from the marina and it was four deep at every, on every office block, every balcony. It was just, there was people everywhere, all watching it, the whole lot, you know, all because so, it's such an, I don't know if you've been to Monaco, Alan, but it's such an enclosed place when you're down at the marina and it's literally hills up both sides. So full of office blocks, homes, whatever, and everyone was just out watching the race. So it was, it was a bit of an atmosphere, yeah. Yeah, because I kind of think, like, I do talk about it quite a lot, like the idea of racing in front of people and spectators. Because I think karting is good for that kind of stuff, but we're not, we're so, we're so sort of shuttered away now with our kart circuits in the middle of nowhere that we're mm. not really in front of people. I mean, there's a few races like in Greece, I know they have a street race in Italy and Sicily, we see the videos pop up. But that kind of thing, just sound, that must have just been like a proper, proper experience. Yeah, no, it's it's brilliant to go and do. Um, as as sort of my first one out there, it was a bit not really daunting. I mean, I've never really pressures never really got to me anything like that. Nothing really phases me. I mean, um, from that point of view. But yeah, it's a totally different world. When you're going and racing, sort of say you go to Wilton Mill and then you go to like the likes of Monaco and you're racing around the streets there, it's completely different. Completely different. So, like, we obviously you mentioned the international stuff now and the costs and that kind of thing like but you went to monaco you you got a podium and you 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 went with your old man presumably in, in jicker i guess that yeah. was the class that's been run yeah, yeah. It, a similar story to what uh, robert kubica told when he started racing i think he went to his first european event with his old man and a similar kind of thing like what's What's diff What's so different now about the carts and the way that it's structured that we don't we don't seem to have that opportunity? I don't hear stories like that anymore. It's like you've got junior OK and senior OK, and it's just like it seems like it's just an exclusive club. I mean, what's the difference, really? I don't really know what's caused it to be honest. I mean, it's you used to, karting didn't used to cost anywhere near what it does now. So it used to attract the sort of privateers and you had a lot of people involved in current for a long, long time that have since disappeared from it um, because of all the sort of the big team stuff. I mean, I, when I, you know, when I raced in the UK, I was also, uh, when I won the, the junior ICA and the Formula A championship, I was sponsored by Mike O'Neill. And at the time, he was the Tony Kart importer. It was the biggest team in the paddock. Um, so I raced for a big team, but we sort of we did a lot of stuff on our own as well, you know. Um, but these days, it's sort of you, you, they're all Arctic lorries turning up with like hundred grand, hundred hundred and fifty grand plus trucks, fifty grand awnings. The, the, it's just got ridiculous how much money's been spent on it. Um, but I don't know. It's the days of sort of. You know, dad and lad karting, certainly at a high level in this country and certainly going to Europe, but we're long gone. You know, you need the factory support from the teams. And in my opinion, that's the way karting's been engineered. Because mm, I, I, do, I, do, I do look at, I mean, I guess KF, when KF came in, I don't know what you think. Like that was like, that, it, was, it wasn't fantastic, but like 
I don't know. It's something I I, even, I do remember. Jicker was 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 quite tricky, but it was pretty reasonable. Formula A, they'd reached their sort of development peak, so you know you'd you'd get a you know all of the engines were pretty good. Um, but then KF came in, and and that kind of just seemed to be like a proper a point where it went from being it was pretty what you know it wasn't fantastic before then, but it was like a big turning point. I don't know what you think about that. Like, was the KF the turning point, or was it really going that way anyway? It wasn't the turning to point. Point it was supposed to be, because the reason they gave, or most of the most of the sort of the, the powers that be gave for going the KF route was because the 100cc thing had got so expensive, the engines had become unreliable. Because at that point, they was getting up to like 23,000 revs at the end of the water called 100cc eras. Um, but then they went this KF route. Everyone had to re homologate their engines, totally changed the designs, of course. Um, it went to obviously tag engines as well rather than direct drive. Um, and the costs didn't go down because the engines were more reliable. They actually like spiraled out of control um, because all of a sudden there's, you've got all the engine companies, you, can't, you could no longer tune the engines like you could before to that degree. So that's the thing. If you've got two mates of engine and you can tune them both as an engine tuner, you get them pretty close to each other. When you've got something that's out of the box that you can you can build the engine and put it on tolerances and stuff like that, you, you can't tune the engine, so you can't level the playing field as such. So you've got what you've got, and that and all of a sudden there was new engines coming out every every month from the manufacturers, different cylinders, this that, da, 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 da. and that's when the factory team stuff became so important because if you wasn't with the right people, you didn't get the latest bit of kit, you didn't win the race. That was that was end of. Hmm. So, you know, for me, when it went KF, that was... And the other thing as well is I think that was part of the turning point with the driving side of things as well, because all of a sudden you've gone from a direct drive, 100cc, that if you make a mistake or you crash with somebody, you've got to get out and start it. All of a sudden, you can just press a button and away you go again. So there was less, less inclination to be a bit more careful and not come off the track. So all of a sudden the driving standards dropped as well over, over the next couple of years. I think that was one of the turning points in the driving standard thing is all of a sudden everything's tag. And <laughs> the consequence was if you crashed in hundred CC, you lost half a lap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can lose maybe three or four seconds and you're back on the road crashing again. Now I, I tell you what though, that, that does make me laugh is I do see people spin off in a tag cart. And rather than getting out, like, because if you've done hundreds, your instinct, as soon as you spin, no matter what you're in, is to get the car facing and you jump and like, and I see people spin sometimes in a road taxi and they'll sit there wheel spinning and I'm yeah. just like, get out the car and move it. So they're, they're, weirdly enough, they sometimes they'll, it would be easier if they had to bunk start it. They wouldn't lose so much time, you know. I yeah, laugh at that. I do chuck off it. Why don't you get out and move it? And they're sitting there pinning the throttle and I'm like, just get yeah, out, the, mate. The mentality is definitely changed. Hmm. I mean, I, I, you know, like, so you you work with a lot of young drivers now. Like, how have, what do you make of the cadet kind scene? Because I know that, um, well, last time we obviously saw you was quite a while back now, but it was like, you're quite an advocate for the Honda cadet thing. Um, I might be wrong now. But obviously people throw accusations at that, that there's 10 grand motors and that kind of stuff. I mean, how how is that developing? Do you, do you, what do you make of all that? Is it just all bollocks or is there something yeah. behind that yes the motors are going for a lot of money now um but i'm afraid that's the same in all classes of karting um again it comes back to that you're not allowed to tune the engine as such so all of a sudden there's this this engine that's really fast and you can't repeat it particularly quickly um so and the sort of the 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 customer base has changed. I say customer base from my point of view now. In terms of the people coming into karting, it's 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 no longer dad and lad racing, so invariably it costs more. And those people want the best for their for their driver, so they're willing to prepare. They're prepared to pay more money for the engines. But it's it's no different from Honda to IAMI to X30 to any of the classes. Um, you know people if they say that oh, i've got to have that engine and they're willing to they're willing to pay any price for it 
um, you know, across the two cadet classes. I don't really, I, yeah, I favour the Honda myself, but, but that's because I've done it for longer and I know more about that class than I do the IAMI. You know, I've done a fair bit of IAMI stuff as well um, with the like of uh, like Luke Potts, for example, um, and a couple of drivers, but it's not what I've ever specialised in. Whereas myself and Rob obviously ran global karting and we ran sort of up to eight Honda drivers then. We had our own dyno, so I know the engines quite well. It's just, it's more what I know. I don't sort of prefer it one to the other. It's just what the sort of route I went down a few years ago and you're better off doing something that you know better than something you don't know. So, yeah, with with I mean the thing I like about Honda Cadets is, um, and this doesn't this, we 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 fall so quickly into like when everybody any anybody someone talks about starting karting, they throw out these big figures like oh don't bother and it's this amount and this amount. And what I liked about the Honda Cadet thing, and I'm a two stroke man. Like you know, oh, you know, but with <laughs> no, cadets, really. with cadets, like I look at, like I can go on eBay and I could find a Honda Cadet like for five hundred quid or whatever it is, and a kid that likes motorsport can get in a Honda Cadet and feel like a a racing driver, you know. Mm. And the things are pretty bulletproof, you know, if you just want to go round and round and round. And it's kind of something that I I think we don't like. To me, that's cool. That's really good. <laughs> You know, a dad and a lad or a daughter well, and a mother or whatever. That's how the class was started. It was started sort of at club level for people who didn't want to go two-stroke. And if you don't know your way around the two-stroke, they can be a sort of temperamental on you. Um, whereas the four-stroke, it was sort of, it's essentially a generator engine. So, you know, pull the cord and away you go. So they're a lot more user-friendly from that, that point of view. But as with anything that's got competition involved... <laughs> it's got more costly <laughs> yeah i do say that like um you know I, I sometimes people would say you know this class is expensive this class is expensive and i sometimes say it's not really the cart that's expensive it's like that the the, the i've got a like a maxter behind me from the 06 world championship right it was raced at the world championship and it cost like 150 quid to buy and i'm like yeah. it's not the it, sometimes it's not the end it's not the class that's expensive it's just the willingness for the competitors to spend money and that it's, really it's, dictates it's, it yeah, exactly. I mean, everyone's always looking for that last tenth or last two tenths. And, you know, it's it comes down to one thing is like a lot of people, if there's an engine there that's two tenths quicker, someone's going to buy it. <laughs> simple yeah, exactly. as that. So what, simple. what do you think about like the sport as it stands going forward? Like what do you where, where do you see the sort of growth? I've, I've, I've sort of sat back this year and I've seen Rotax in the UK. It seems like it's recovering a little bit. I don't know. Um, it just seems like that seems to be the picture at the moment, and then you've got this massive growth of IKR championships. It is, you know, mm. as, I'm an advocate of IKR, but I, I it's, there's like a lot of going on. It's hard to get a grip on what's what, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously in the current situation, and last year, it's it's difficult to tell which way things are going to go. Um, I mean, obviously, none of us have raced for months now, um, so. We're, we're actually trying to sort dates and stuff out at the moment for, I'm actually working with Synergy this year with a factory team in Honda with my old uh, business partner, Rob Hanscom, helping him run that and trying to sort anything out in terms of dates and, you know, weekly things are being moved around. And unfortunately that's the way it's going to be this year. Um, in terms of going forward um, karting, it, it's difficult to say, you know, it, it's, there's always something new comes out. I mean, the Rotex stuff I like, um, I get on well with the X30 classes as well. It's just, you, you know, you, you're working with a racing engine and just another go-kart is the way I look at it. Hmm. You know, so, I mean, I like both. You know, so it's, I think the X30 is certainly more competitive at the high end of the British Championships in terms of, um, you know, the driver. Uh, the sort of, the, say the top five drivers who I rate in this country, they all, they'll all do X30 and then move on to maybe Europe or racing cars and all the rest of it, and then do some road tax as well. The thing with the road tax is it is it's a little bit more user friendly. So you've got like the southern area of England, southeast of England is massive on the road tax side of things. The likes of like Clay, Forest, Mansell Raceway, places like that. All, all they do is road tax and then your cadet stuff. 
So, you know, and then it's the same right up, right up north as well. There's a lot more Rotax than there is except the X30 seems to be sort of the 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 main sort of recognised British championships in terms of seniors and juniors now. But when it goes to club level, um, it depends what part of the country you're in. You know, the Rotax took a hit a while back, but it has come back strong and, and made some massive improvements with all the Rotax equipment. Mm. And what do you, like, obviously, I think we we had a quick chat before this and you'd watch the Danny Curl one. Um, I, in the, it seems to me like... We, we like the British Championship. Like back in the day, was the British Championship in my view. Like you, you obviously we had Bobby Game. Everyone knew who Bobby Game was. Then you mm-hmm. won it, and then obviously as it moved into the water cooled era, that was when Rotax was kind of taken off. And the way that karting works in terms of like recognizing the elite drivers, it actually comes from the the. It's like the drivers decide now what the elite championship is because there isn't isn't one. Do you think the sport? benefits from sort of the way it is now where you kind of can just go and race the British Championship if you want it, it, depending on I say the British Championship I mean whatever class you choose like, it gets a bit confusing or do you do you think it would be good to have a bit more of a focal point that's recognised as these guys are the nuts because obviously we look at Danny Curl and I go Danny Curl's a world champion I know instinctively that's the guy that you should all want to beat because um, he's the he's the number one but that title was put upon him by the drivers, really. But what do you what do you think about that? Does that sort of what, what, what are you thinking? Because you come from an era of like these are the nuts. These drivers are the nuts. I know Mike Spencer's the nuts. I know freaking Bobby Game is the nuts. And obviously, like Litchfield, even like that, I was like Chris Rogers. We all know that these are the guys that we all want to beat. But now it's a bit harder to find that. I don't know. Um, I think one of the factors is obviously there's a lot more classes than there used to be. Um, you know, back then we had obviously two stroke cadet like coma cadets. Then you went into that, you had to go into junior TKM, um, due to the age limits. You had to do a year in TKM, or you could do more if you wanted. Then it went junior ICA, and then you had to do a year in ICA due to the again the age restrictions. You could do ICA the year of your 15th, whereas Formula A you had to be 16 to do it, depending on what year they chopped and changed it with the rules. Um, so there was sort of a trodden path. Um, now there's a lot more options. You've got X30, you've got Rotax, you've still got all the TKM classes. Um, you've got two cadet classes. You've got minis, you've got juniors. It, it's just so many classes and choices to choose from. So it spreads the talent across multiple grids. So whereas sort of you used to, if you, if you wanted to know who the best was, you used to just go and watch the Formula A race. Simple as that. You know, that's what the best drivers all did because that was Formula A, then you had ICA, then you had 100C as well. So it went basically, it was obviously it was 100B before, so it was like Formula A, 100B, 100C, you know. So now it's sort of stretched across all the classes. I mean, obviously, you know, the the, the best these days in this country, race X30. Um, but again, that was one of the the sort of byproducts of the the okay stuff or just costing too much money it, they tried to get it going here and it just it ran for a couple of years but not on a big scale it's just too expensive simple as that you know so people want to race a one mate class that cost them less money which is you know which is great but it then do i do rotex do i do x30 do i do this do i do that what do i do hmm. you know and that's what you're up against now yeah, that's what makes it difficult from my perspective because like I can, I can invite people on very easily. Like I go, I know Mike Spencer, I know Danny Curley won the world championship, but nowadays I find it increasingly difficult to really get a grasp on who the personalities are and where the narrative is, you know. And I guess like we talk about X30 is really kind of the British the British championship class, but um, it would be nice if like the elite drivers had the sort of um, everybody go to the fence to watch factor like it used to be with the Formula A. Like, I do miss that, but I, I guess it's it's hard, it's hard to get back that factor. Yeah, I think things have changed too much now for it to come back to that, unfortunately. It is what it is. And, you know, dare I say, there's too many people making too much money out of the way things are. Mm-hmm. I got, it's quite funny because people, I, I actually, I, even though I helped augment this IKR idea I'm like I actually would like a stronger governing body to go right no that's the class 
this is where if you want to be the nuts this is where mm. you've got to be and that's it you know but um I think it's changed too much over the years for that to be happening again, to be quite honest. It's sort of you're talking about racing the way it was 20 years ago, and it was great. Yeah. You know? I don't want to be too, like, looking back. That's my problem. I'm really fearful. Like, I want a positive, like, message going forward. So, like, I want to encourage people to watch Danny Curl. Because I want, like, a young kid to, like, look at Carton, look at Danny Curl, and go, I'm going to beat him. Because I remember when you when you did the, the race at Ella, like, you were wired i don't if i don't i hope you don't mind you wanted to beat like i remember you looking at ollie and going i'm gonna i'm gonna have him i'm gonna beat him mm. and they had that that kind of thing and i like the idea of danny curl because he's the number one in the country to be on a pedal stool where people are trying to take him down because that's kind mm. of the story you know i think that'd be quite quite good yeah he's, he's the one to beat now i mean danny's a great guy i always speak to him when i see him you know he's always sort of got, got he's always got time to chat to you um, you know, and he's a great driver. He wins a lot of races. And you know, what I like about Danny is if there's a race for the lead and there's five of them, usually he wins. You know, if it's a close race, he's sort of, he'll get stuck in and won't won't leave anything on the table. Simple as that. And that's, that's the way I like to use the, I used to like the race is, you know, it's sort of, if I didn't give it 100%, well, it, it never happened. You know, I'd always give it 100. And it was sort of, you know, uh, you know, strongest man came out on top sort of racing was the old school style of racing, you know, mm. and you don't see that in many drivers now. Yeah. So uh, is that what you think he's got? He's good. He's, he's what do you, what yeah, do you think? He's, you know, he's that little bit harder and, you know, got that little bit more killer instinct than the guys around him, <laughs> you know, and, you know, he's got everything else to go with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think it's, I think the more we can talk about it, the better it will be because it gives, I want, you know, it gives people something to, aim for like uh, we talk about I mean I, we can't ignore the elephant in the room like obviously you move to cars there's an instinct to move to cars like is there a, is you know how is are we falling for the car thing a bit too much is it, is it I think part of the demise certainly of senior karting was when a few years ago and I said it as it happened was as soon as they lowered the age that you could drive a racing car um, because obviously people who are serious about their racing career want to get in a racing car as soon as possible, you know, so they come through and connect straight to the juniors. Well, they haven't even got race seniors now. Like you jump straight in a racing car and test at like 14 or whatever it is and then be racing at, say, I can't don't even know what the age limits are now, but in my opinion, they're too young to be going around a racing track at 100, 120 mile an hour plus. Yeah, you know, I think that was... Um, um... And that was part of what, give that the, the karting took a hit for that you know because you sort of raced all the way through seniors then you went to racing cars once you'd done your sort of time in karting and learned all your race craft and grown up a little bit and now i mean you can jump straight into formula four at like 15 16 years old whatever it is it's just you know it's crazy it's, it's right. weird it's kind of odd like um i look at the international karting and i think senior okay is like um you got senior AK, and they're all kind of really, really young who end up doing it, bar a couple of yeah. exceptions. And then you have KZ, and like the average, I did this thing. The average age of the top three in KZ is thirty-one, which is higher than yeah. like the F1 right now. So you have got this weird gap of like guys in their twenties that, like that spread of guys in their twenties that aren't yeah. really racing carts. Like uh, that's that's kind of a shame, I think. Well, sort of, you had a lot of the sort of drivers in Formula Super A stay for years. David Foray, um, you know. Uh, David Foray and those sort of drivers that have all sort of gone into the, the 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 gearbox class now because they all race each other still. And you get the older guys who want to stay in karting. That's in, invariably where they end up doing gearbox racing. Whereas the OK stuff, A, you've got to be tiny to be able to even make the weight limit now, which is ridiculous. So you've got your 14-year-olds coming straight into it. Um who can jump in it, make the weight. If well, sorry, if you're if you're five foot ten plus, you've basically got to be a stick insect to even get near the weight now. Yeah. Yeah. Ridiculous. Yeah. You know, they lowered the weight a massive amount, obviously a couple of years ago, and it's made it very hard. So a lot of the, the sort of older drivers or the sort of drivers, where do they go? Get into the KZ. Simple yeah. as that. Yeah, I you think know? there's um there's a kind of weird caveat in the regulations. They've got they've got an OK plus clause right. in the regs that's that puts the weight up so like the minimum weight for a driver is 80 kilos 
So I don't know if yeah. they've got that in there to kind of deflect criticism for the lower weight limits. But I'm like, who who's going to be racing okay? Who's 80 kilos in a separate no. class? Nobody. <laughs> like, there's no. no market for that. It was no. it's kind of an odd little thing they've got there. Like the weight limit, I don't think people realise. Like when Danny Curl said, you know, you have to be 65 kilos. Yeah, Danny Curl's a grown man. Yeah. He's not short. No. <laughs> I'm short and I can't get to that way. <laughs> I, I was 65. Like, it was weird. It's borderline. Like, um, I think David Henry. Coulthard mentioned it. He said he used to, he had a, an eating disorder. And I'm like, this is serious. Like, it's, yeah. you can't get to that way without seriously damaging yourself if you're a big lad, yeah. you know? It's ridiculous. 65 kilos. You know, I know junior drivers in this country that are heavier than that. Yeah. Absolutely mad. Crazy. Well, so. well, Mike. I've got to say thanks for coming on. Um, no problem. At all. Yeah, just it's love to hear the old stories and you know that what everything you've done because I think it's one of those things. Is there's some great stories out there and great achievements. So hopefully we can uh, do this again sometime. And um, thanks for coming on, mate. No problem at all, Leonard. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was great to hear. talk about karting for a change. <laughs> I've had a bit of a lack of that over the last three months.